Hello, I'm Nia Griffiths and I'm the Member of Parliament for Llanelli and I'm the Shadow Secretary of State for Wales. And I use the pronouns I, she, her, and of course, I was a teacher before I became an MP. And I was a teacher at a time when there was Section 28 in uh, force. And that effectively meant that we couldn't teach about same-sex relationships. And I was actually in a relationship, in a same-sex relationship with another teacher at the time. So you can imagine it was quite a difficult time. So it's great to meet you, Finn. And I just wondered if we could chat about whether things have got better or whether there's still an awful lot to do in terms of making sure that all young people feel comfortable and happy talking about their sexuality in schools. Yeah, of course. And there's loads of things I'd want to ask you as well. Hi, I'm Finley Bertram. I'm a member of the Welsh Youth Parliament for Newport West. I identify as he, him, and I'm a university student at the moment. So going back to what you were saying about uh, what it has been like for me compared to what it's been like for you, it's I, obviously it's been very different, very different experiences. But I think some of the things you mentioned about Section 28, I think that the looming shadow of Section 28 is still really, really prevalent in schools. There's no open space to talk about talk about LGBTQ issues in the way that they need to be talked about, in the way that it's healthy to be addressed and talked about. Do you think yeah. that even though, you know, I can tell you awful stories about how um, members of staff even, uh, particularly male members of staff, would make lots of, you know, very homophobic type comments back in the 90s. And although now we still have um, legislation, we have equality, um, we have policies, we have all of that in writing. But do you think that some of those underlying attitudes are still there? or that young people feel that they're still there and fear that they're still there? I think you're right. I think it is more to do with the the feeling and the fear that young people have. I think it's, well, it's obvious that there's uh, anti-discriminatory policies in practice and teachers aren't allowed to be openly discriminatory and homophobic. But I think the attitudes that are prevailing sometimes through through the legislation and even if not then, even the, the perceived attitudes by the young people makes them scared to come out and scared to look for help when they when they really need it. And, and do you think also that there's there's still a feeling that, um, you know, being gay is something somebody else does and it's not in my family and that for every young person, there's quite a barrier to firstly working out what's happening to themselves and understanding their own feelings, but then actually trying to communicate that, particularly sometimes with those actually closest to them. Yeah, I think so. And especially in schools, I think it comes down to the lack of representation, the lack of even hearing the word gay sometimes, even in the most little ways, even mm. in diagrams or um, like teacher stories, there's no mention of, or I've never encountered any mention of LGBTQ inclusion and that makes students feel isolated and alienated and oh this isn't something that happens this isn't something I should be thinking about even when it's within themselves and they are thinking about it and they've got no choice but to think about it because it's who they are it's their identity. Exactly and I think there are so many examples in life where as you say all the images are heterosexual I mean it was very touching and very sad but a real step forward a couple of days ago to see on the television when they were talking about people who'd lost loved ones because of Covid to um, see uh, a gay man who'd lost his partner. And that was so sad, it, it brought back to me the awful memories of what used to happen with the HIV situation where people were not even able to speak about it and they were you know, lying effectively to their friends and family. And very often they were not allowed to see their loved ones in hospital because there was no sense of next of kin. There was no civil partnership. So they couldn't, um, you know, grieve and and in, and 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 be with their loved ones in their last moments, as uh, everybody would want to be. Um, and I, I just thought, you know, nowadays at least we can be more open about that sort of thing. Yeah, and don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that nothing's changed. I'm not saying that things are as bad as they were under Section 28 and uh, back in the 80s and 70s and 90s. But I say I think I'm trying to get at there's not been enough change, enough change to be fully progressive and 
um, in my uh, sixth form in high school, I set up an LGBTQ group and just the sheer number of people who came to that because they needed a space to be themselves and be around like-minded people and just f- like be, be the who they are without fear of prejudice or discrimination it was awful. Like it was really good that people felt comfortable enough to come, but it was awful the number of people who needed to come who felt like they couldn't be themselves anywhere else. And I remember, um, so I used to do it in lunch times, lunch times on Wednesdays. I remember one time, one of the kids, I think he was yeah, year, uh, from a younger year, was said to me, this is the only reason I come to school on Wednesday. And that really hit home of how much needs to change but also how easy that change is because it didn't take long for me to set that up. I emailed a few teachers, got a room, advertised it around the school, did a few assemblies and promoted it. And then I had 30, 30, 35 kids coming in and and it showed how important it is and how lacking it is. And I think, you know, it's a fantastic initiative, but the fact it was left up to you basically to do that. I mean, that's, that's the sad thing, as you say, um, there needs to be much more mainstreaming, much more, uh, reference examples, um, not just uh, perhaps in one area of education, but right across all areas. I mean, we've got an exciting opportunity now, haven't we, with this new curriculum. Um, what do you think are going to be the main difficulties to making sure that really, really does happen in schools? Well, I think there's obviously, um, with the new curriculum, implementing all across areas of life skills of community skills things like that life skills includes sex education especially for lgbtq and uh, including lgbtq sex education and i think the pushback from some parents and even some students may be uh, a bit of a barrier to cross that but i definitely think it still needs to be done nobody should be robbed of their right to uh, learn about safe sex uh, absolutely i think there'll need to be lots of help and support and training for teachers but have you seen any, you know, good educational materials? Any, you know, have you seen anything that is 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 good and easy to use with young people that um, is inspiring that that actually gets across messages? Yeah, I know um, Pride Camry for one. I know Stonewall do um, educational resources uh, reports uh, detailing about uh, LGBTQ discrimination in school, as well as informational resources about how to set up an LGBTQ club, how um, to best best practices to go about teaching about LGBTQ sex education and really informative things that the government and the teachers can look on and realise, right, okay, it's not that difficult. <laughs> Why have we not done this before? Mm. So it's really important that we get that out, isn't it? We make sure that there's real access to to all of that in in, in in schools yeah and in terms of uh, in terms of politics obviously I've gone into politics and I think we all go into politics because we you know we want to change things for the better um, and there's a sort of feeling that life should always progress but sometimes I see things tending to slip backwards um, only very recently um, we've had a uh, minister for equalities in the House of Commons um, effectively saying that LGBTQ issues are not as important as perhaps you know, we would like to, to see them be, as if that didn't matter much. Do you think it's really important that we, we don't let people slip back? 100%, because progress is all good, but then if you reverse that progress, you've, you've not done anything. And I think mm. that is that's awful, really, that they said. I, I think it's safe to say that things have progressed, but it doesn't mean they need to stop progressing you still need to work on that progression because people can fall back like you said people can fall back and slip back into old habits as easily as they can get rid of them so and, and i think there are people out there whipping this up on the you know on, on social media some really anti anti gay you know really homophobic type stuff um you know, particularly coming from some very evangelical groups for example yeah I think you're never going to completely get rid of homophobia we've taken some steps in the right direction but it needs to be focused down double down on that it's not okay it's never been okay it never will be okay Mm -hmm. so could I ask you um because I've recently just left high school I've recently left sixth form what was your experience like in school both as a student and as a teacher under section 28 well I think as a as a pupil I think very much there were very 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 few role models and I think there was a a huge um, pressure on people particularly in those days people tended to get married a lot younger 
um, was very much a pressure to find a girlfriend, find a boyfriend. It was very much in the, you know, the heterosexual stereotype um, mode, really, all that you saw. Um, university, there was a bit more um, freedom. There was obviously uh, young people were a bit more able to express themselves. And, you know, there were um, you know, people who were openly gay. Um, at the time, the, you know, the, the gay societies tended to be very, very male dominated. Um, and I think it's always been the case that women in some ways have an easier time because society has criticised them less, but in other ways are very invisible. Um, and I still worry a bit that that's a bit the, a bit the case, even now in LGBTQ space. Um, but uh, yeah, as a teacher, of course, it was very difficult. Um, suddenly having this legislation brought in uh, by Margaret Thatcher's government, um, making it really difficult. It was just at a time when I think perhaps people were beginning to you know, think they could talk about things. They were beginning to be one or two characters in soaps on the television and things like that. And then suddenly uh, to, to find uh, this, uh, this awful legislation. So it did make it difficult. And I think the first thing to try and do was to try um, not to let people get away with homophobic comments and so forth. But even that was quite tricky, um, you know, how you could tackle that in a way that um, wasn't, as the legislation said, promoting same-sex relationships. So um, it was a tricky time. Uh, having said that, of course, it did spark a real reaction um, and people did then get together and really try to, you know, try to push back. Um, but, you know, if you think it's really very recent, for example, I think probably about you know, 1989, that um, you know, we had Joe Winterson, Oranges Are Not The Only Fruit, which is probably one of the first um, very openly um, gay dramas on TV. Um, you know, obviously she was talking about her, you know, her lesbian experiences. Um, in that a semi-autobiographical type drama. So it's, it was still very, very new, I think, um, having any role models, having any, um, any images out there which people could copy. So I think there's still a huge amount for us to do. And um, I don't think we should think by any manner of means people find it easy now. I completely agree. And when you said about uh, when you said about tackling the LGBTQ discrimination, did you ever experience any systemic uh, systemic homophobia from teachers in inside the schools when you were a teacher as well? Were there any teachers who were fully supportive of Section Twenty Eight and even went further than it to promote homophobia? Um, there, there were definitely there were definitely teachers who, as I say, would make all sorts of totally inappropriate comments. Um, and they thought that was perfectly okay, you know, to make fun of people. And um, that, you know, is obviously very, very sad. And, you know, it is obviously a tendency for teachers to reflect society. But, um, you know, we've really got to, to work on all of that. And it's not just about getting rid of the negative, as we just said, it's also about creating the positive, um, and making sure that we do have, um, you know, examples um, we do have in every walk of life and in every subject area. Um, you know, we talk about uh, you know same-sex relationships as much as as um, heterosexual relationships. Yeah, that is hearing that <laughs> that teachers would say things like that. That's awful because how impressionable young people are mm. at that point, and how how empowered teachers are. That must have mm. instilled values in those children that well <laughs> not great values so when you were a, when you were a teacher during section 28 were you in the position to do anything to help or were you were you helpless did you feel helpless i think you're in a very difficult position because um you know it wasn't part of the curriculum and it was very much a matter of trying to um you know trying to stop really unpleasant homophobic type comments and trying to do it in a way that was, you know, relatively neutral, but, you know, trying to point out to people that, that you know, that wasn't appropriate. Um, so, yes, I mean, it was, it was difficult. It was helped a little bit, as I said, when we had a couple of soap characters where you could say, well, you know, you wouldn't want to 
say something like that, would you? Um, you know, that would think how that would hurt so and so's feelings because you could do it like in the third person. Then you're talking about you know somebody who's fictional, and that's a lot easier. So you could do it a little bit in that sort of way. But I think I think there's always been a little bit of a problem um, in schools with personal uh, relationship education because I think it's quite difficult for teachers to teach. And I do think we need you know, specialist teachers to help. Um, that's not to say, as I say, everybody shouldn't have an awareness, but it's to say that when you're talking, you know, you're having sort of sex education lessons and so forth, um, most people's um, recollection of them is not particularly positive. Um, and you want people who are really, you know, confident, not embarrassed, who are able to, you know, talk about all aspects that obviously young people talk about in the playground, um, but is often taboo in the classroom. Yeah, and talking about that, I my even even now my sex education in school was for one very heteronormative, and for two awful. It was so unhelpful. Mm -hmm. We labelled a sperm cell and labelled an egg cell, and that was it. And they were, the teacher was like, "That's that." Mm. Okay, mm. great. <laughs> And you were um, going back to what you were saying about um, how media influences um, LGBTQ discussion in the classroom, talking about was it orange is not the only fruit. So yes, that right? yeah, yeah. yeah. How much um, over your span of teaching and uh, as your role as an MP, do you think that the media portrayal of LGBTQ uh, individuals has improved? Oh, it has improved dramatically. I think where um, before um, it was very, very negative in the media. Um, it was always seen as something to be ashamed of or um, put in a negative context. I think if you go back um, to, you know, to, to the media. Um, that said, of course, I mean, there are still occasions where you think that they've put in reference to someone's sexuality almost in a sort of wireism type way. Or um, you think well, why is that part of that story? It makes no difference whether that person um, is gay or not, but they've referenced that they are. Um, and you think, you know, there's something still slightly unhealthy, I think, sometimes in, in the portrayal. Mm, I understand. I think it's about, like I was saying, holding on to these, these values that are obviously no longer accepted, but still loom over, loom over society. Because mm. I've only remember positive portrayals of LGBTQ characters in in the media. I'm that young apparently. But yes, but so then I think you also have to think of what's what's not there. Um, you know, where is the Premier League footballer? You know, there are there are still, you know, areas where we don't have any we don't have any role models. You know, that's the that that's also it's a it's a sort of if you like what they call a sin of omission that that you know we haven't got them. Um, so I think there's still quite a long way to go. And obviously you have to ask yourself the questions as why that is. Well, clearly there's still a lot of fear about, um, particularly in certain circles, I think. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, that really, that's really strikes home because I'm a massive sports fan. I play sport all the time and there's hardly any LGBTQ role models for me. And yeah, I think, well, there are LGBTQ role models, but I feel like they don't feel comfortable enough being out because of, well, they're scared of the media, of the fans, of losing fans. I think that's what we need to progress as, as a society. So people aren't scared anymore. That's the end goal of all this, isn't it? Well, well, absolutely. And so that people can be, you know, totally open, and you know, and and there isn't that sort of worry all the time. If I come out, what's it going to do? What's it, you know, what's the effect going to have on my career or or whatever? Which is still clearly there in people's minds and I think the other thing is not wanting to be only seen as um, gay or LGBTQ um, in the sense of that you've got things to say about everything else as well and that you're not just defined in that tiny space and I think that was one of my fears um, it, when I you know came into politics that if that was what you sort of said about yourself um, very early on then people only ever came to you about that sort of thing. They didn't come to you about the whole uh, general panoply of, of politics. And I think that's also a bit of a danger, whereas you wouldn't do that for anybody else. Um, 
you know, just because they, you know, they came from Cardiff, you wouldn't always speak to them about Cardiff. You know, you'd still speak to them about the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I agree. I think it's about minimising the importance of it, really. Or not the importance, but just how the prevalence of it in people's minds. Because, mm. like you said, you wouldn't ask someone from Cardiff only about things from Cardiff. So why would you ask someone to get you about only things, only LGBTQ relating mm. issues? Mm. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, if we want to get to a stage where there is genuine equality, then it is about, it's tackling those negatives. It's tackling those um, issues of singling out, isn't it? And um, so there isn't that singling out anymore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, going back to um, my LGBTQ club in school, I heard some some stories there that I can only describe as awful, horrific, about um, students, trans identifying students and non-binary students who have had some run-ins, let's say, with teachers for not using correct pronouns and uh, not respecting their gender identity. What was the transgender uh, experience like? I know you know, firsthand you can't say, but uh, that you witnessed when you were a teacher and when you were a student? Um, I think it was even less understood than it is now. Um, you know, I think it is very much, in, uh, if, you, if you like, it is the new frontier, isn't it? It's an area where there is still horrendous prejudice. And I think there's a huge job of work for us to do um, to overcome those fears and worries and prejudices that people do have. Um, and, you know, it is such a, a, a hugely challenging psychological situation for a young person to be in um, and to have to face really appalling uh, prejudice and criticism as well as obviously all that they're going through anyway um, is just is just dreadful but as I say I think it was really really very little known about um, you know even sort of 30 years ago um, and we have come a long way but you know, my goodness me, it is, it's frightening how people just don't seem to be able to move on and, you know, accept things. Um, how we, it's like having to go through all the same sorts of battles all over again. And you think, well, why? Why can't, why can't people be uh, more accepting? Um, it's, it is very, very worrying. It is really disheartening. What's even more disheartening is a lot of the transphobia I hear about comes from within the LGBT community with mm-hmm. um, gay and bisexual cis- cisgender people saying, or LGBTQ identifying cisgender people saying things like, oh, there's only two genders and saying transphobic comments. Mm-hmm. And that, I mean, that's awful because, you know, one of the, you know, one of the big battles that I'm sure you will have read about um, was how you could, equate some of the prejudices against one group in society with those against another and how you can you know offer mutual support mutual understanding and I think one of the the big examples of that in my generation was the help that the LGBTQ community gave to the miners in the miners strike so the obviously you know um, as per the the film Pride which I'm sure you know about but um, the the issue I think is to say to people, well, you know, how is it that you think it's okay for you to be accepted and you're lucky that the battles have been fought, if you like, on your behalf, and yet you're not prepared to accept other people who are going through exactly the same sorts of battles. And I I just, I, I just find that really, really, really upsetting. Yeah, so do I. I think it's a, step we need to take or a leap rather we need to take as a community as well as addressing it within the wider wider society because we can Mm. prove protest and appeal for trans rights all we want but if it's systemic within our community as well then we're not going to make it very far no exactly and you're, you're absolutely right and and you know the easiest thing to do is to divide and rule isn't it it's an old tactic from many many years ago um, and we've got to try and make sure that we don't fall for that and that we try and you know, unite the progressive forces and, and make sure that uh, we, you know, we recognise the difficulties and talk through them with people and, and try and overcome them. Exactly. Mm. 
<laughs> so a big agenda, lots to do. <laughs> so what are your uh, next moves? <laughs> uh, I haven't had breakfast yet. Hang on. <laughs> uh, have you got any um, more questions for me about uh, a younger person in politics uh, and LGBTQ life? Yes, I mean, I, as I say, I, I'm just quite interested to to know um, how how easy, how difficult it is. You think for for younger people, um, you know, to to be themselves. I mean, is there still a feeling that um, you know you're the exception, um, or do you feel that you're um, on on a par with all your friends? I mean, you know, what's the what's what's the sort of feeling that you get, particularly going forward? And as you know, as a university student now, we know that the difficulties of school and the bullying. But in the in the more wider, more adult space, how how do you think it pans out? I think. Uh, like you said, in high school, there was obviously issues with the bullying and alienation and things like that. But now I've been in uni, not that I've actually been in uni because I've been sat mm-hmm. in my room all day. But um, from the online spaces that I've seen, it seems to be there's an LGBTQ society that's a um, majority female um, identifying led, which is really, mm-hmm. really progressive, really, really good. Uh, I think yeah. it's amazing. And mm-hmm. um, so the LGBTQ society is really really large one of the largest societies at the university actually and i haven't com- encountered anybody with issues which is really quite refreshing because <laughs> not it's exactly mm. something i'm used to but it's so i think going out into the wider world because universities are generally fairly liberal spaces yes yeah. but yeah it definitely makes a really really nice refreshing change from from high school mm, mm, mm. But um, as you say, that is potentially perhaps a very, a very select sort of space. And there are many spaces out there which are still not in that, in that league. Yeah, because yeah. I'm thinking, maybe it's just a worrying thought at the back of my head, really. But going through university will be fine. And then getting out into the great world, will I be passed down for promotions because I'm gay? Or will people not get on with me the same with my boss not like me because I'm gay I, I don't know and it's just that worry that we shouldn't have to worry about in 2021 but it's, but, but it's just still that. yeah I mean you know as a woman if you don't flirt with your male boss does that mean you don't get promoted you know I mean it's it sounds awful but that sort of thing is still going on that sort of um subtle type of prejudice um, which is there, and people have expectations of you know, of how you're going to behave and how you should behave in inverted commas, and um, it goes against you if you don't behave like that, you know. Um, so I think I think there are still a lot of issues like that there, which are, as I say, they're they're more subtle, but they're definitely there. Yeah, I completely agree. It's these unspoken, like you said, expectations and mm-hmm. unspoken and spoken language really about how um, people from different to LGBTQ to not LGBTQ react with each other and uh, talk to each other really that can sometimes perpetuate these these feelings these worries inside your head but then also sometimes makes you feel a lot better like my um, group of friends at the moment is they're all straight guys which I've never had before and it's really great (laughs) Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. it's good to see that things to, are also progressing in my lifetime as well as over the longer course in my educational lifetime as well as over like the longer course of time well that you know, that that is that's really really encouraging um but as we've just said obviously there's still lots to do but it's great that things are you know things are improving um yeah let's keep it that way i i do hope so and i think that's what we want to get out of this we wanted to have this intergenerational talk to see all right, maybe things aren't great at the moment. But the world might be falling apart, but things are getting better in at least some respects. And we need to work together to make sure through through generations to make sure that these things stay progressing and that we can keep on on our right track. So along those lines, what work, um, I know we've discussed it a fair bit, but what work do you think still needs to be done, both uh, in terms of government policy and in terms of societal feelings well well, I do think first and foremost that the education one is really important that's why I'm pleased that the you know the Welsh government has said that all children should be included in sex education lessons including uh, LGBTQ um, lessons 
And I think that's really, really important. And it worries me that there will be some pushback from parents, uh, some parents, um, which is very, very sad because, um, you know, their children, perhaps more than any, um, would benefit from you know, having the full range of issues in society discussed openly, and perhaps a way they can't do at home. And so I think we need to stand really firm on that. And I think we need to be supportive in terms of the materials we put in. But, you know, there is a huge, huge tendency for teenagers to have um, a, a sort of dominant peer group pressure to conform in certain ways. And that obviously does lead to a lot of bullying. It's partly, I think, about young people finding their own identity, trying to affirm their own identity and doing that by being part of a, a peer group, a crowd. Um, and it can sometimes then turn very nasty if there are certain prejudices that are, are there. So that issue of bullying, which then does go through into many workplaces, unfortunately, is, is something, you know, the number of suicides and so forth, all of that is still a huge area, um, a, a difficult one. So I think that's somewhere where we've really got to get on the front foot um, and I think there's still a tendency for schools to sometimes brush aside either because they're just too overwhelmed and too busy or because they somehow think it's better to hide a problem rather than be open about it. Um, and that's that's awful um, because, you know, things can then escalate and get uh, absolutely out of hand. Yeah, I completely agree. And I completely agree with what you're saying about how if bullying isn't stopped in if homophobic bullying isn't stopped in schools then how it can escalate and carry on to the workplace because if people aren't told this is wrong this needs to be stopped this can't go on then what if that person becomes the ceo of a company or what if that person becomes higher working manager then that person's values will pass on down and they'll people it's not just school bullying at that point it's people not being offered jobs it's people possibly living on the streets because we know that the homelessness level of LGBTQ people is way above the average. So I completely agree, much more work does need to be done in, this, in these, these points. Mm -hmm. And is that related in any way to rejection by families as well? And is there more we need to do um, working with parents? Oh, 100%, 100%, because obviously, obviously there's a generational divide in between parents and kids, mm. that's the way it works. But and then the generational values are obviously so so different now as they were back when well at least when my parents were uh, growing up and I'm sure when other people's parents were growing up obviously and I think that that work needs to be done because the values that were ingrained like you said through the media through the news were instilled in their minds about what LGBTQ people were like are probably still there unless they get taught unless they learn that it's, that's not the case at all. So I completely agree. Mm. Mm. Okay, good. Well, awesome. thank you very much. Thank you it's very been much. Really this has been, talking to you. It'd be fantastic. Oh, it's been great. Mm. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>